Director Alfonso Cuarón explained during his press tour for Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, a theory he had come up along with director Guillermo del Toro. Remember when your mom used to give you a big bowl of cereal in the morning and you had to finish before you could get to the prize, the small toy that was at the bottom of the box? He went on to explain how both he and Del Toro thought of the more commercial movies they had directed as the serial that would allow them to make passion projects like The Devil's Backbone or Y Tu Mama Tambien, the fable toys in the story. Now Guillermo and I have a secret that we don't tell our mothers, Cuaron whispered with a playful grin. We love the serial as well. The past decade was massive for the trio of well-known Mexican directors, aka The Three Amigos. Each one of them admired for their authorism and reaching major success and recognition after masterly playing the Hollywood game. In this video, I go over Cuarón's, Del Toro's, and Iñarrito's unique film careers, their long-lasting friendship, and I analyze how is it that they were able to achieve this, this, and this. Cuarón became the first Latin American director to win the Oscar for Best Director and Best Film Editing and the second to win twice. Iñárritu, the first Latin American director to direct a Best Picture winning film and the first Latin American to win Best Director back to back and also the first to win Best Screenplay. He also has a Special Achievement Academy Award for his virtual reality project Flesh and Sand. Del Toro is the second Latin American director to have a film win Best Picture and the third to win Best Director. And how does being Latin factor into all of this, if it does? But let's set aside all of this and, without context, we aren't anything. Cuarón and Del Toro met first in the 1980s when they were working on the Mexican TV series La Hora Marcada. Del Toro was a special effects and makeup guy from Guadalajara. You needed a monster, better call Del Toro. Cuarón was an assistant director from Mexico City. Del Toro approached Cuarón asking if he had made a recent episode inspired on a Stephen King story. Cuarón said, yeah, indeed. Then Del Toro said, let me ask you something. That story was so great, so how come your show sucks so much? That was the beginning of a wonderful friendship. Iñárritu entered the picture in the mid-90s, connecting with Cuarón through their mutual cinematographer friend Emmanuel Lewinsky, aka Chivo. You know him. Lewinsky won an Oscar for Gravity, Berman, and The Revenant. Iñárritu eventually brought Cuarón early cuts of his gritty and ambitious film Amores Perros, a film I'll talk about in another video. It deals with an accident in Mexico City that connects three very different groups of people. According to Jatra Sotar in the book Gael Garcia Bernal and the Latin American New Wave, he writes that Del Toro had watched a copy of Amores Perros and called Iñarritu to tell him he had made a masterpiece, but that it was 20 minutes too long. Soon, Del Toro showed up at Iñarritu's door to help him cut it down, sleeping on the floor for three nights until they got it done. I was taking out minutes and air between the sequence, Del Toro says. I also suggested the intertitles using the names of the characters. He was very happy. Del Toro also helped Cuarón with edits fighting friendly but vehemently about Cuarón's cut for Y Tu Mama Tambien. The New Yorker reports that the Menasha Tra scene near the end of Y Tu Mama Tambien was Del Toro's idea. Their love for cinema and ability to be blunt with one another has forged a friendship that is based on critiquing and improving each other's work. The New York Times writes that, despite living physically in different places, Iñarritu and Del Toro live in LA, Cuarón lives in London, so an official business relationship with lots of phone calls and email messages flying back and forth across the planet seemed the best way to continue the conversation about cinema they have been having since they were starting out and first met here two decades ago. Cuarón said in an interview for the LA Times, there's no film I do that doesn't go through them, their eyes and their hands. But well, how is it that each director reached this level of fame and respect in a town that cruelly has eaten alive more than one person of color's dreams?
Let us start with El Toro, who, incidentally, was the first to cross over to the US with his English language killer bug movie Mimic in 1997. However, it wouldn't be until his fantastical war story Pan's Labyrinth and comic book adaptations of Hellboy and Blade II that he began to get attention of Americanos. To say that Del Toro's films are interestingly different from the two others will be an utter understatement. They don't scream his nationality or any Latin roots whatsoever, but eyes and mind open to catch on the little details. The New York Times writes about the group, most of their films have not been explicitly about Mexico, but their background comes through in subtle ways. Film journalist Salvador Franco said, Del Toro's films show a belief that people have in spirits and demons that you find in small Mexican pueblos. Mr. Del Toro's style can also be compared to the literary magic realism of Latin America, as he mixes serious dramatic moments with sea monsters and fairies. When promoting The Shape of Water, Del Toro was asked how he tell monster stories being the joyful and loving person that he is. He simply responded, I'm Mexican. The Washington Post writes, In The Shape of Water, the influence of Del Toro's Mexican heritage is evident in the mixture of the mundane with the fantastical. It's a style that resembles aspects of magic realism, or, as some academics prefer, marvelous realism a literary technique that presents a real-world setting with enchanting elements frequently attributed to the Latin American authors. As explanation for the fantastical, eerie creatures that populate his films, Del Toro has told the New York Times, I have witnessed an inordinate amount of violence in my life. No wonder he grew up in Guadalajara, Mexico, a notorious epicenter of drug-related conflict. As a teenager, Del Toro volunteered at a mental hospital located next to a moor, where he saw everything from stabbings and gunshot wounds to decapitations. Then, in 1997, his father was kidnapped and held hostage for more than two months. Add to that an extremely strict religious upbringing. He compares his grandmother to Papi Lore's character in Carrie, and the full picture comes into focus. I consider myself a lapsed Catholic, he says, but I try to take all that's beautiful about religion, free will, virtue and ability, and apply it to life. Ultimately, my films are about characters trying to access some kind of spiritual realm on Earth. The interesting aspect about Del Toro's filmography, and just to say, this is not a criticism towards his films, but rather a distinction between Cuaron, Iñarritu, and Del Toro's, is that he barely employs Mexican actors or references Mexico explicitly in the movies he directs. His films usually deal with the Western world, that is, Spain or other Anglo country, and is, for the most part, populated by Americans and Europeans. But Mexico has informed the richness of his stories. In making Pan's Lavra, Del Toro drew upon events he witnessed while growing up in Mexico, as well as his own imagination, to create a story that is itself a labyrinth. A maze is a place where you get lost, but a labyrinth is essentially a place of transit, an ethical moral transit to one inedible center. Even when we examine Del Toro's first film, Del Toro and Kronos are clearly not obsessed with authentic national culture. In fact, they flaunt their migrancy and hybridity, yet Garcia Conclini's claim that we have abandoned our obsession with authentic national cultures appear overly optimistic in terms of critical responses for even works like Kronos, which conjoin territories, languages, genres, and traditions, are evaluated in terms of authenticity. While the elusive identity of Kronos draws convention from diverse traditions as well, vampire movies, love stories, family dramas, and black comedies, the filmmaker described his creation as a cross between a classic horror film and a melodrama, and anticipates the confusion this will cause for audiences. People are going to say it's a Mexican Catholic vampire movie with mariachis, but it's not, he said. I think of it more as a sick but really very tender love story. But you know what? Del Toro doesn't have to do anything. F expectations. The fact that he's Mexican doesn't have to dictate the sort of stories he tells or who tells them. The New Yorker perfectly describes Del Toro's unique authorism. His films remind you that looking at monsters is a century-old ritual, a way of understanding our own bodies through gorgeous images of deformation. 
many contemporary filmmakers seem embarrassed by the goofiness of monsters, relegating them to an occasional lunge from the shadows. Del Toro wants the audiences to gawk. He told the journalist that there is a part of me that will always be pulp. Drawbacks have not been absent from Del Toro's career, as not all his movies have found mainstream audiences. Highlighting the mismarketed gothic horror film Crimson Peak and his frustrated attempt at directing the Hobbit series, which didn't happen because of unstable funding, it's hard to tell Del Toro's serial from his real prices. I'd say whatever Del Toro thought at his serial became neither, because films like Mimic, Hellboy, Pacific Rim, or Crimson Peak weren't commercially successful, or at least they didn't meet those earning expectations. I'm talking to you, Pacific Rim. The only movie I would say has been his real so-called serial is Blade 2, a movie he did not write. He was simply hired to direct it. In the end, it seems like his toys found at the bottom of a serial have also become his serial, meaning they are passion projects which have enjoyed some sort of commercial and critical triumph, mostly just Pan's Labyrinth and The Shape of Water although I recommend you check Kronos and The Devil's Backbone. At some point, pre The Shape of Water, things looked like they were taking a downturn for the director, yet call it luck, call it preparation meets opportunity, without a doubt, Del Toro's ingenuity and his monsters are reshaping the genre of fantasy. Quaron is a different beast, not in the literal sense. Slate has described him as a versatile man of a cinema capable of conjuring the unexpected in the massive canvas of a Harry Potter movie, the eerie stillness of space and gravity, or the black and white frame of Roma, where the director recreates his childhood home and 1970s Mexico City in pristine detail. After the success of Solo con tu pareja, a film about a womanizer on the verge of suicide, having been tricked into thinking he has HIV, Sota writes, the film proved a triumph on release and Cuaron was soon fielding offers from Hollywood. There he made A Little Princess, another success story. Cuaron then entered a period of flops. Despite staring Gwyneth Paltrow and Ethan Hawke, Alfonso Cuaron's big budget Great Expectations flopped. It was a very tough experience to deal with and made Cuaron question his filmmaking credentials, but things would get worse before they got better. Another project Cuaron had been dedicated to fell through. I needed to make something closer to my roots, something creative which reflected my culture, my language, my upbringing, he said. The result was Y tu mamá también, which I've discussed previously in another video. It's a film about two young adults in Mexico going on a road trip with an older woman. What's so clever about this film is it's also commentary without sounding preachy. The two young men representing the immature, inexperienced, blooming Mexico, the teenage nation, whereas the older Spanish woman represents the powerful, influential nations of the old world. Sota writes, In games of treachery, there are older, more experienced players than Mexico and its new world cousins, often competing for higher stakes. Luisa doesn't simply complete the triangle, she shapes it to her taste, just as the first world nations do with developing countries. Cuaron has appeared excited about directing different genres like fantasy, doing a Harry Potter, or the sci-fi, Children of Men, that's his serial. Yet the real prices for him have been films like Y tu mamá también and Roma. In fact, in 2006, when promoting Children of Men, the Hollywood Reporter wrote that Cuaron has been thinking about making Roma for more than a decade. After his 2006 sci-fi drama Children of Men, he announced on Charlie Rose that Roma will be his next film. Of course, it wasn't. After a hiatus from the screen, he took some time off for personal reasons after going through a divorce. His present dystopian thriller Children of Men, which was nominated for three Academy Awards, disappointed at the box office. His marriage with Italian actress and journalist Annalisa Bugliani fell apart in 2008. As Quaron wrote Gravity, he worried not only about supporting his kids, but also about paying divorce lawyers. 
It's a story of a woman floating alone in space trying to survive catastrophe and grief may be read as an expression of his own emotional state. The New York Times writes, For most of his life, Cardona has struggled to juggle his auteur ambitions with his need to stay solvent. For years, when asked why he directed this or that Hollywood movie, Great Expectations, say, or Harry Potter, Cardona has given journalists variations on I was running out of money and I needed to survive. When I came to picking a winner for that year's best director, an anonymous voter said, It was always going to be quite on. It's a directorial achievement. It's an amazing piece of directing. And it was a risk. And I like him. He's got a really interesting body of work. He's somebody you want to do things for and with. He has been characterized as a control freak, a visionary, and a risk taker. But in the grand scheme of things, he's an innovator both narratively and technically which has enabled him the sort of versatility in his filmography, immersing around different genres of interest. Slade writes about the three amigos, instead of trying to shape the business to their own particular taste, all three choose to, as Diego Luna explained it to me, play the industry game. For Cuaron's case, a few of his films had delivered critical and commercial triumph, to which Hollywood has rewarded him with the opportunity to make smaller films, films that thus far have written back to the exploration of his homeland Mexico, delving into its social inequality, its immaturity as a country, and its flawed democracy, and not necessarily playing the Hollywood game. But his so-called serial has granted him the freedom for these different ambitions to coexist within one space. Speaking of narrative and technical innovators, Alejandro González Iñárritu is that. Before film, he worked in radio and then publicity. He decided to study directing with Judy Weston and released his first feature in 1995, a TV movie called Detrás del Dinero, Behind the Money. He then made Amores Perros, 21 Grams, and Babel, known today as the Dead Trilogy. There isn't a direct connection within the fictional narrative of these films, but the non-linear structure and themes are similar throughout the three movies. Interwoven stories, accidents, greed, recklessness, death. In an online essay, it says, Iñarrito made us aware that even though we are different from each other in terms of culture, language, and traditions, I would even add socioeconomic background, there is a sense of underlying commonality we all share. In a world defined by politics, greed, power, and authoritarian regimes, he made us realize that comprehending human connectedness may be essential for the ethical future of the planet. This underlying notion of codependency was pervasive in his much-famed Dead Trilogy. The rising violence in his home country, coming at a time when his own public profile was increasing, factored heavily into Iñárritu's decision to move his family to LA, moving shortly after Amores Perros was released. His mother had her jaw broken by muggers, and his father, in a separate incident, was thrown into the trunk of a car by kidnappers and held for 12 hours for a $500 ransom. He says it also informed his approach to violence in his films. The violence became such a painful social situation in my country, with so much suffering that I didn't find it funny in films, he says. After Babel, Iñarrito's collaborative relationship with screenwriter Guillermo Arriaga, author of the entire Dead trilogy, was fraught and perhaps irreparable. Arriaga was upset about the changes Iñarrito made on his script. Sota writes about one of those changes made, saying, Originally, the deaf and mute Japanese teenager had been a Spanish girl who had lost her sight. It seems that Iñarrito didn't even allow Arriaga to visit the set. Arriaga then declared their working relationship dead and buried. His next film, after the Dead trilogy, Beautiful, no less gloomy or dark, in which the main character, played by Javier Bardem, helps to manage a Chinese swap shop, has an alcoholic for a wife, and is dying of cancer. The Rolling Stone writes, was critically and commercially Iñarrito's worst performing picture despite having two Academy Award nominations for Best Actor and Best Foreign Language Film. The press, and approaching 50, Iñarrito says he fell into a very, very difficult state. To snap himself out of it, he went to a 21-day silent meditation retreat in the south of France. Every morning, he would stare at the clouds as they shifted and changed colors, and he felt like he'd never seen anything more spectacular. The problem with Iñarrito's early films is the lack of air to breathe. There's very little comic relief and lots of pain instead. 
an element that most audiences usually avoid if they can. Who wants to buy pain? Rolling Stone writes, But the suffering Iñárritu piled onto his characters were beginning to feel not only sadistic but false. A subplot climaxing with a Mexican housekeeper, Adriana Barraza, stumbling through the desert in high heels and a ripped cocktail dress so over the top, given everything else that has already transpired in the film, it nearly plays as camp. When Iñárritu made Berman, it was a huge tonal leap. The Rolling Stone writes, As in all of Iñárritu's films, the main character, the actor Regan Thompson, takes a merciless beating. Pretty much everything that can go wrong for him over the course of the film's two hours does. The difference here is that Iñárritu seems to have realized that when you inflict a series of punishment on a character, it can be King Lear if played one way, but play another, it's Charlie Chaplin. In comparison to all of Iñárritu's previous films, Birdman is a funny movie. It doesn't cross borders, the characters are not in precarious, you might say, life or death situations, and it's told in a linear way, in fact, cleverly giving you the sense that it's one single take. He admits as much, his love of dark movies and books come from his mother. Sad music, I always thought it's more beautiful than other music, he says, but at the same time, I am in my personal life a very happy guy. I have a sense of humor, I am not the kind of depressed guy all the time brooding, no, I am very enthusiastic about things, and that's why for me and Berman was so liberating to be able to laugh about tragedy. When you watch Berman, you'll find yourself at the edge of your seat, as every scene is more compelling and indulgent than the previous one. Personally, if I may editorialize, I didn't think it deserved best picture, it's Hollywood rewarding itself yet again. But that doesn't mean it isn't a great film, in fact, I would say it's Iñárritu's second best one after Amores Perros. Well, that's my opinion. What made Berman so remarkable is that it wasn't the type of film one would expect to be written, produced, and directed by Iñárritu. Until then, it wasn't the type of filmmaking he was known for. His movies were moderately successful, but he didn't go across genres or play with fantastical themes. But in this case, Iñárritu, like what on with Gravity, was a director who made a grand mainstream film and the director just so happens to be Mexican. One might say that it certainly helped that the plot of Berman was fully in the States and that the characters were occasion to attract wider audiences in a pre-Parasite winning Best Picture era. If you knew nothing about film, you certainly wouldn't know that a Mexican is behind Berman. The same can be said of Iñárritu's subsequent film, The Revenant, a very hard move to make, as Iñárritu and Chivo decided to use natural light, costing a fortune and, rumor has it, several disagreements amongst the filming crew. If you want more tea on the subject, I suggest you read the full Rolling Stone profile. I will leave the link in the description below. Ultimately, if we look at Iñárritu's progression in Hollywood after Amores Perros, his films started to be populated with A-list actors like Naomi Watts, Sean Penn, Benicio del Toro, Kay Blanchett, Brad Pitt, Javier Bardem, and even helping DiCaprio win his very sought-after Oscar. Whereas Cuaron ate cereal to find the prize at the bottom of the box, Iñárritu started with the prize and then ate the cereal, that is, doing passion projects and moving on to making commercial ones. What eventually catapulted him into winning Oscars back-to-back -back was movies that were considered more mainstream, with A-list actors, lighter tones, and technical innovations such as one single take feel in Birdman and the natural light choice in The Revenant. Now that he has eaten his cereal, it seems that Iñárritu is going back to the prices, as his next project, Limbo, starts a non-Hollywood Latin actors and it presumably takes place in Mexico, question mark, or at least it's being filmed there, that we do know. So it begs the question, what does being Mexican have to do with being a great director? In 2006, the three amigos had on Bell perhaps some of their best work thus far. Del Toro had Pen's Labyrinth, Cuaron had Children of Men, and Iñárritu had Babel. It led to the media and critics foretell a Mexican cinematic renaissance, as the movies combined earned 16 Academy Award nominations and it won four. Iñárritu told the New York Times, Yes, I am Mexican, and I have a past and a culture, but what matters is the film itself, not where it was financed or cast. Cinema is universal, beyond flags and borders and passport. The New York Times writes, These guys are Mexican through and through and embrace their heritage and everything that comes with that. 
David Lynn, a chairman of Universal Pictures, said of the three amigos. But they have a global perspective, much as I hate that phrase. It fascinates them to tell stories in Mexico, Spain, the UK, and the United States because what drives them, quite simply, is an interest in what it means to be human. Renowned Mexican film critic Fernanda Solorzano believes the group's success began with their individual decisions to leave Mexico. They recognized early on that the industry in Mexico couldn't give them either the conditions or the budget they needed to advance their careers. They could have become complacent, they could have simply rested on their laurels. Instead, they chose to take risk. All three have been courageous. There are multitudes of buts, however, where we try to curl these films in terms of genre. In The Revenant, Lewinsky's cinematography uses natural light and has a Tarkovsky allure. Gravity features one of the most dazzling tracking shots of recent cinema, and well, The Shape of Water has the unique imprint and sensitivity of a cult creator who is widely loved. This fluctuation from the roles of genre into the pursuit of a personal style can be found in a good amount of the properly American filmmakers appearing in the pages of Peter Binskin's Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, and in the above-mentioned P.T. Anderson. Certainly, their experiences as Mexicans have informed and influenced their work, but they are citizens of the world, universalists who borrow and are inspired across anthropomorphic borders. They became successful directors in the pursuit of a personal style and craftsmanship. The fact that they are Latinos might just be a big plus. Ultimately, the further success of the Three Amigos in the past decade and all of the Oscars are the results of tenacity, experience, a global lens, increased visibility on their own authorism, and a balance of cereal and prices. And in the last 25 years, I've been living in a country all of our own. Part of it is here, part of it is in Europe, part of it is everywhere. Because I think that the greatest thing our art does and our industry does is to erase the lines in the sand. Mm -hmm.